Mormon Mental Health Podcast is a production of the Open Stories Foundation and relies on donations from its listeners like you. To help keep this podcast alive, please consider becoming a monthly subscriber. Any amount will make a difference. You can click the right-hand donate button on mormonmentalhealth.org. All contributions are tax-deductible within the United States and go towards podcast production and building community support and program development for Mormons on various paths and journeys. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to Mormon Mental Health Podcast. This is Natasha Helfer Parker. I have a real treat in store for us today. I don't know how many of you remember a few weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago or two now, I did an interview with Kevin Klusterman about R-O-D-B-T. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means. And he had gone to a training learning about kind of this new theoretical way of doing therapy. And so I was super excited to, to hear about it and learn about it. And then he had been trained directly by the people who have kind of created this theory. They listened to the podcast and they agreed to come on our show. So I'm so excited to have Erica and Tom Lynch with us from all the way from the UK, I believe. Is that correct? No, no, No. South of France. We live in the South of France. South of France. That's even better. Oh, I probably shouldn't say that. (laughs) (laughs) You're right, Natasha. It is. It's a lot better. (laughs) I guess that's where I'd like to go a bit more. How about that? So let me just tell you a little bit about Mormon Mental Health, and then I'll get started with the interview. So Mormon Mental Health Podcast is a podcast that I've been running for many years. I, you know, try to cover a wide variety of topics on a wide variety of issues that have to do with mental health. I feel like, you know, having been raised Mormon myself and involved with the Mormon population my whole life, there's lots of issues that our community faces, like every community. And at the same time, we have our own quirks and our own ways of kind of dealing with things. So I'm super glad to be offering this as a resource, especially since mental health issues do tend to still be taboo as far as people willing to get help, willing to admit that there's an issue to begin with, et cetera. So Mormon Mental Health tries to raise a lot of awareness around issues that hopefully help you understand things better, whether you're going through something yourself or family members, people in your ward, communities, state communities, and therefore we can hopefully be better equipped to help each other through, you know, some of the difficulties in life. Mormon Mental Health Podcast fully is dependent on listener support. I can only continue it under the Open Stories Foundation if it gets enough financial support to be considered financially viable on its own. So it takes about $10,000 a year to make that happen. And we're not really on track this year to meet that. We do have a lot of wonderful donors and I thank you so much for that. But if you happen to be a regular listener or somebody who's new to the podcast and want to support this project continuing, please help us do so. There's a lot of costs involved in, in editing and just, you know, websites and lots of kinds of things that go into this reimbursing people for their time and energy, et cetera. So that's more mental health. If you need to know anything else about me or what I'm offering, you can always go to natashaparker.org. I have an online practice. I am usually presenting or talking or speaking somewhere. I offer consultation and supervision also for people going through ASEC certification, lots of different things. So if you want to know more about me, you can always go to, to my personal website and see what I'm up to. As far, I don't think I have any other announcements other than just to remind people that Sunstone Symposium is coming up in Salt Lake City. The Mormon Mental Health Association will be having a conference on August 1st that's kind of in conjunction with that. More information will be coming. Again, those are not necessarily things that are officially tied with Mormon Mental Health Podcast, but I try to at least you know let people know things that are coming up. So without further ado, let me give Erica and Tom a chance to introduce themselves. I have a little bit of an introduction that I'll just throw out there. So Thomas Lynch is a professor emeritus in the School of Psychology at the University of Southampton. He was the director of the Duke Cognitive Behavioral Research Treatment Program at Duke University for several years. I finished that in 2007, I believe. And he is currently the director of the Emotion and Personality Biobehavioral Laboratory at the University of Southampton. He's the treatment developer of RODBT, which is a new transdiagnostic treatment approach 
informed with about 20 years of clinical research. Strong roots in standard DBT, which stands for Dialectical Behavior Therapy. He's been the recipient of multiple large research grants from a range of sources, including the National Institute of Health, and is the recipient of the John M. Rhodes Psychotherapy Research Endowment and a Beck Institute Scholar. So this uh, treatment and him as the founder is recognized internationally as a world leading expertise in difficult to treat disorders such as personality disorders, chronic depression, and anorexia nervosa. Those are probably some of the hardest things that we as clinicians try to find treatment for. So let's see, he's the author of, of Radically Open Dialectical Behavior Therapy, which theory and practice for treating disorders of over-control and the skills training manual for radically open dialectical behavior therapy, a clinician's guide for treating disorders of over-control, which we'll talk a little bit about OC and UC. The OC stands for over-control, UC I believe stands for under-control. All right, then we have Erica Smith-Lynch. She's the chief executive of Radically Open and the Director of Treatment Development and Training for RODBT. She's been involved in the development of this model since 2008 and has been working alongside Tom, who also happens to be her husband, and training therapists, including Kevin, who is also joining us today. And we were just talking about how they just finished up a training in Seattle. So they're dealing with a little bit of jet lag. I deal with jet lag just going to California, so I can imagine... (laughs) Just a two hour difference does it in for me. Unfortunately, we're not going to see their wonderful faces because we're dealing with internet connection overseas and stuff. So they will be audio only, but I'm super excited to have them on. So Tom and Erica, welcome to the show. Thanks, Natasha. It's good to be here. It's great to be here. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So why don't I just kind of, you know, first of all, give you an opportunity to introduce yourselves further. If, you know, if what I said wasn't exactly what you'd want people to know about you. And then let's just dive in into the development of a new model. Like that's always so exciting. How do people develop new models? So um, anything else you want to say about yourselves first? I, I don't have much more. I think you said a lot and I'm, you know, Mm-hmm. I'm perfectly good with it. I'm glad you mentioned that Eric and I are married because I may call her darling or something like that during our interview today. <laughs> so, <well done. laughs> yeah, some pet names we might we might have to put up with as I'm saying, <laughs> be nauseated by. No. <laughs> no, I think I think that the only thing that I want to add is that kind of like Tom didn't set out thinking, oh, I, I'm going to develop a new treatment. Um, he was sort of interested in. Um, people who had difficulties expressing their emotions and started off trying to figure out whether DBT would work for them, but found out pretty quickly that it didn't. And it's just been a process of him trying to figure out what these people need and how to best help them. And the treatments just kind of developed over the last 20 years. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of how it happened. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so Tom, talk a little bit about that, because I think that we as a profession were very excited about DBT when it came out. I know I have been. It was it was taught to me as kind of a breaking new theoretical approach, especially for personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, these kinds of you know diagnoses in a lot of ways are in our clinical field kind of get written off like, oh, you have that? Well, sorry, not much we can do, which is very kind of a condescending way to treat people from a mental health <laughs> treatment style. So what what are your thoughts about just DBT in general and, and why you were, I'm, I'm guessing you were excited to try it too. What was, what was problematic with it? Well, I mean, for me, it was, um, you know, dialectic behavioral therapy I, I, having been very well trained in it and, and working with Marsha uh, for many years. Um, Who's good. the founder of DBT, right? Correct. Yes, Marsha yes. Linehan is the uh, founder of Standard DBT. And um, so, you know, I mean, it wasn't that I thought there was anything problematic with Standard DBT until I started to apply it to a completely different type of population than it was originally designed for which was uh, borderline personality disorder, which is uh, now really b- better thought of as an under controlled type of personality problem. And in fact, uh, leaders in the personality field, that's kind of, that's more or less how they're moving uh, to start to think about personality problems. At least a, a large number of people around the world that are scientists studying that type of thing uh, are starting to move that way. But, you know, essentially um, very quickly, you know, realized that 
the population I chose to treat, which was chronic depression, um, and selected people that were a little bit older purposely so I could get uh, a good sample of people that, you know, struggled with expression, might have been a little bit more rigid uh, in terms of how they approach things um, and, you know, um, and had great inhibitory control, which we learned a lot more about over time. And, you know, um, so we sit there and, and apply this treatment standard DBT, which is designed for emotionally dysregulated individuals who, uh, you know, have uh, poor impulse control and, and poor distress tolerance. And, and it turned out that the people we were applying it to actually had superior inhibitory control, superior capacities for tolerating distress, superior capacities for inhibiting impulses and planning ahead and uh, perseverance and all these types of things. In fact, they had too much of a good thing and um, it was causing them a great deal of suffering. But because their uh, way of signaling their distress is so indirect often or understated, you might say, and because often many of them are perfectionists, so they don't want to admit to making a mistake, you know, people, they don't stand out so much. But the, the data, though, is interesting when you look at it, because the most common personality disorders in the community and that we're seeing in treatment, but we just often don't diagnose this, is over-controlled personality problems. In particular, uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder, and avoidant personality disorder are, co are very common in clinics, but often we don't think about that so much. We often, people automatically start thinking about borderline if when they start thinking about um, personality problems. So right away, we realized that there was, this population was very different so Kevin, to bring you in a little bit, so Kevin, why don't you tell a little bit, just people in case they haven't heard your last interview, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who's Kevin Klusterman? Yeah, yeah, it's great to, to be back on, uh, on the podcast and uh, bonjour to uh, Erica and Tom. Um, <laughs> bonjour, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I'm a therapist now in private practice, but I, I worked in a hospital setting for uh, probably about 21 years and, and just just recently left that and, and I'm now just doing uh, private practice and my website's relationquest.com and I really just had a fortunate circumstance when I was with um, uh, uh, the hospital system that I was working for that my clinical uh, manager decided to send me and another uh, co-worker to uh, Chicago, uh, which is close by to us, and to, you know, uh, get this introductory experience with something called RODBT. And, you know, we'd never heard of it before. And we just, you know, my director just kind of looked at this little blurb. And I was thinking, man, this is just probably some type of, you know, small variation on standard dbt they tweaked it a little bit probably a little bit like medications you know they just tweaked the formula just a little bit and boom you got a you got a brand new medication so you know i was kind of going in with maybe i don't know neutral or low expectations and um and erica and tom were were training in in chicago and i have to say it really um it really was profound. You go to some of these trainings and you're like, yeah, okay, I learned some new things, but uh, you, you know, to, to put it in a, maybe a pun sort of way, it was radically different <laughs> than, than other trainings I'd experienced. And um, I think it's probably RODBT, uh, you know, affected me in such a way that, um, you know, I said, I, I can't wait for them to come back to Chicago and do a full scale training. I've got to go right now. <laughs> and this probably smuggles a little bit of my personality type, but uh, I, I got to go right now to New Jersey and I'm going to get the full training. And so, you know, that kind of tells you, you know, for me, it, I just learned so much. It really broke the frontiers for me um uh, of of things that that um you know maybe i'd taken for granted or didn't see or blind spots and i really agree with tom you know working in a hospital setting for as long as i have it's almost like borderline personality disorder 
sort of has become, at least I think in, in a lot of different settings, basically almost what it means is something's not working. Medication's not working, typical uh, therapy's not working, maybe CBT's not working too well, maybe we tried acceptance and commitment therapy and nothing seems to be working. And so I think a lot of people are getting diagnosed as borderline when, when that's the case, possibly. And, and RODBT began to sort of open my eyes to sort of this blind spot that we're missing a whole piece of the puzzle here. And, and, and I think Dr. Lynch really laid, laid down uh, another piece of the puzzle. So that was really long, but um, <laughs> I'll, no, I'll, I, I really appreciate that. And then yeah. just because you kind of bring the Mormon voice with me to this whole thing, you know, as they're talking and they're saying things like, oh, people who are really good at controlling impulses and people who are perfectionistic and people who, and I'm like, wah, 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 you know, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That fits a lot of, and I mean, not to, you know, throw our entire religious culture under one bus, but you know, we, we tend to have a lot of those traits, you know, yeah. in, in yeah. Mormonism. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the intersection then between those two things? Yeah. So th there's a number, you know, uh, born and raised Mormon, of course, like, uh, like you. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just a lot of things, you know. So when, when Dr. Lynch and Erica talked about the, you know, sort of the social component, you know, there's kind of the the temperament component, and then there's, you know, sort of the environmental, you know, social component. Um, you know, again, as as a Mormon, I thought about my Mormon upbringing. You know, which is for the most part not entirely, but um, you know, there it's very rule governed. You know, it's there's there's a lot of focus on duty and responsibility and and rules and uh, you know how how that sort of impacts, um, you know, person, you know, again, like I sort of said before, and Dr. Lynch and, and Erica can maybe speak to this a little bit more, but when you get the message, mistakes are intolerable. You know, you can't make a mistake, you know, and I, I referenced a, a, a well-known author, a children's book in our, you know, kind of faith tradition community, the Not Even Once Club. <laughs> you know, it's a children's book. Okay. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, kind of the message to, to children that maybe a lot of us are, are, are giving is, you know, making a mistake is intolerable. You, you shouldn't even make a mistake even once. Um, it, and that's written, by the way, by the wife of the current prophet of our church who also happens to be a marriage and family therapist, I believe in her background. So even with having her background to be in the mental health field, she still can somehow fit in this idea that this level of perfectionism is, is okay to, to teach, right? And, and right. In that regard. And, and of course, probably with good intentions, because in RODBT, something that, you, you know, Tom really stresses and in, in the, in the curriculum really stresses is we don't know what we don't know, you know, and that we all got to maybe take a little bit of a uh, you know, kind of some humility medication to recognize <laughs> that. Um, I prefer it in humble pie form. Kevin. Oh, humble pie. That's <laughs> a much more uh, traditional way of saying it. Because, you know, in America, we're very focused on meds here. Um, I don't know what it's like in the UK or France. So, um, yeah, we, we all got to kind of, you know, step back and just kind of say, you know, we're we're at sort of the frontiers of, of what we know and, and helping, you know, RODBT just does such an, an just phenomenal job of helping people to open up to new possibilities, to recognize that we just don't see things clearly. Like we all carry around perceptual uh, and bio uh, temperamental biases, all of us, you know, and and, you know, I've sort of noticed in my own life that, um, you know, it, it's easy to be arrogant and think, you know, I, I think I've been that way with RODBT. I start going around telling everybody about RODBT and it's, you know, that it's, 
incredible thing, you know, but in, you know, a hundred years from now or 200 years from now, if, if our species lasts that long, I think we will, but, you know, we'll learn new things. And, um, but for right now, this, this really, really, uh, I think pushes the boundaries into, into a new paradigm that, that I get, you know, pretty excited about. So, you know, I think, I think she was probably doing the best she could, you know, when, when writing that that book and, and and obviously had really good intentions and probably doesn't know about you know a lot of the the new research perhaps or um you know is just seeing things in a different way and um and maybe some people do need to tighten up a little bit like me going on and on and on and on here and not letting <laughs> our, our incredible guests uh, speak here so I'm going to mute myself here. I'm going to put, <laughs> put in some controls and maybe Thank some you, Kevin. <laughs> for controlling your impulse. <laughs> yeah. Got to work on that. All right. Well, so yeah. So getting back to, to Tom and Erica, I, I mean, when we think about self control, and I picked this up off your website, you know, you describe it as the ability to inhibit competing urges, impulses, behaviors, or desires and delay gratification in order to pursue future goals. And, you know, as Kevin just kind of explained, we teach this a lot in our Mormon culture that, that this is actually seen as something very worthwhile to delay gratification, to put the, you know, quote unquote, natural man aside. And as we've kind of been talking about in some types of diagnoses, learning some of this is probably a good idea, which is a lot of what dialectical behavior therapy is about, is emotional regulation, kind of helping people, you know, be able to, in those moments of high intense feelings where, you know, maybe we're just going to self-soothe by doing destructive things or talk in destructive ways to the people that we usually love the most, you can learn some impulse control. Uh, And so what you're saying, Tom, is as you were trying to, you know, apply that model to certain populations that was actually doing what like exacerbating issues or just kind of having a neutral effect or what what were you finding well i, I mean i think uh, what i was observing was that um it didn't necessarily cause harm but they the patients uh that were that are over controlled that get uh, a treatment that's designed to increase their inhibitory capacity when they already have superior capacity for uh control. Um, they, it just didn't, it wasn't necessary. It wasn't so much needed for them, but because they have a tendency, a natural tendency to mask their inner feelings and not reveal concern or, or weakness to people, partly again, because they're perfectionists, they don't want to be seen as making a mistake. I think we go back to this notion and don't ever make a mistake. So they don't tell people often about times that they're feeling vulnerable or distressed, they'll downplay things. And so they, they just don't stand out. One way to yeah, I was just, just going to piggyback on that, Natasha, and say that um, I think that uh, the people that were misdiagnosed and put into a DBT class, um, in the main, probably just kind of like, they've got really good distress tolerance skills, so they probably just like surfed it and thinking, you know, what's all this about? This is supposed to help me, but it's not but they wouldn't have made a big noise about it. They wouldn't have complained about it a lot because that's not their natural tendency. And what we hear from um, therapists that come on trainings is that those that are DBT trained and are giving uh, people DBT therapy and running DBT skills classes usually have a pretty high proportion of their clients that they feel DBT isn't working for. These people don't participate in skills classes. They do what they sometimes they do all of the homework um, uh, things that are that are given to them to do, and they don't they're not making any progress. And so when we start to talk to therapists, they often start to realize they start to be able to picture clients that they have that have been through DBT and it just hasn't helped them. And in fact, what we're starting to do now is to collect data from therapists on misdiagnosis, and some of the numbers are pretty scary. Um, anywhere between 35 and 65% of people who have been through some of the DBT clinics that we're working with have been misdiagnosed as borderline when in fact they have an over-controlled personality disorder. And um, I think that Kevin kind of touched on it when he said, you know, some people like might think, oh, wow, this person's suffering and nothing else has worked, so let's try DBT. 
Um, but there's also a lot of um, components of the diagnosis, like the factors that you would look at to diagnose somebody as borderline, which on the surface kind of look the same, but when you start to dig down underneath um, about what, what causes those things, it's very different. So for example, suicide behavior, uh, self-harming, OC over-controlled people engage in self-harm. They're also suicidal, but they do it in a very different way. It's very planned. They don't talk about it to a lot of other people. Um, suicide For their suicide urges, they're much more likely to um, actually go through with it because it's so well-planned. And sometimes they can plan it like 12 months in advance. Mm. It's not done on a, an urge that, oh my God, I just can't handle this anymore. Um, and the self-harm behavior is done in the same way. It can be very planned, you know, um, they can, and they do it kind of in places where nobody can see it. And it's done in a way which can look, even look very controlled, you know, like the, they, they minutely um, look at how they can uh, do self-harming, which is done in a very symmetrical and regular way on their bodies. Mm -hmm. And, um, but not always. I mean, no. and, and I, I agree that this notion of them not wanting to stand out or, you know, this is why, no, they don't like the limelight uh, unless they have planned for it. Um, be, and why? Well, in other words, they're the kid that doesn't raise their hand in the class and say, me, me, me. They're, they've had this uh, problem, you might say, or this personality style. And by the way, we all have a personality style, so it's okay. But um, because of the genetic basis of uh, over control and under control when you're at those extreme edges or, or places with this they um they i've, I've kind of lost my train this is a jet lag i can tell right now my, <laughs> you, you know where I was yeah, maybe what you're going to say is that one of the reasons that they don't um, um when they self-harm, they don't do it for attention. They don't want to go to the that's emergency right. department. That's right. That's so th that's what's going. interesting is, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's not that they won't, it can happen that they'll get hospitalized. There's always exceptions to everything. But in general, they, you know, they're not going to want to be going to the hospital where a, an under control might uh, do it for attention or other things, lots of reasons, but end up not be so uncomfortable about having um, people know about their problem, you might say. Um, so over-controlled individuals, you know, are not the people that you see, you know, shouting at each other or yelling at each other from across the street or robbing convenience stores on a whim. You know, I guess you could say they, you know, they set very high standards for themselves. And, um, and, and so they're, they're con constantly often trying to correct themselves, you might say. Um, and so, you know, I guess you could say they don't need to learn how to take life more seriously or try harder or plan ahead or behave more appropriately in public. You know, as I mentioned earlier, they have too much of a good thing and their self-control is out of control, you might say. Yeah. And because society values self-control yeah. so much, they get reinforced for it. That's right. And I was just thinking that on the outside, they can look pulled together, you know, because they can go to work, they do follow the rules, they have good distress tolerance, um, but inside they are really suffering. It's just on the outside, it doesn't look quite so obvious as it does with, say, a, a borderline patient who, you know, can really um, express their distress in a very overt way. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because as we got into this more and more, we began to realize that uh, if you, anyone in a clinic or like Kevin's at a hospital where I'm aware of imagining there's a whole range of difficult clients coming in, but, um, you know, like if you're treating just depression or and Depression really is increasingly seen as a chronic condition, but chronic depression is clearly associated with very high rates of personality disorders, which people don't often recognize. And it's not borderline, that's the most common. It's the uh, over-controlled problems. And so we, we have rate, the rates of uh, over-controlled personality disorders, just say in a depressed sample, is anywhere from 40 to 80%. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah, and, and you know, personality disorders, are more difficult to treat because uh, in our opinion, it's because of the biotemperamental components, some of the biological genetic components that are part of uh, those kinds of problems. Right, personality is more something that's kind of wired, right? The way we're wired, temperament, things that were kind of, that come as part of our makeup, not necessarily learned behavior. Is that what you're trying to explain? 
Yeah, um, that some of the most recent research that's been coming out from um, a whole range of personality uh, researchers or uh, people that uh, do longitudinal studies looking at kids and see um, and, and, and examining them over 40 year trajectories or um, people doing genetics research. Uh, it was really interesting, probably about, I don't know, about, probably it's 15 years ago now, <laughs> I guess. Um, you know, independent research labs doing different, using different methodologies started to recognize that there was consensus emerging. And it really reflects this notion of these superordinate um, personality styles over control and under control, and that you can kind of break the population into that. So people, you know, every person, you, know, you could say, broadly speaking, leans either toward under control or over control. And it's really it only gets to be a problem for someone is when you have that biological basis. And the problem for the uh, over-controlled person is that they're biologically hardwired to perceive new or unfamiliar situations as dangerous rather than rewarding. And so um, combined with their natural tendency to master inner feelings, it just makes it harder for them to form social bonds with you know, others, close social bonds. And so as a consequence, uh, over-controlled individuals are you know, suffering increasing social isolation and loneliness um, and that type of thing. So it's really a problem of loneliness and not emotion dysregulation. Mm, I just wanted to go back to the temperament. Bit, sure. Because please, that's yeah. where we, that was kind of like the, the, the question that Natasha sure. was asking about, which is yeah. temperament is kind of like the genetics for how you experience and express your emotions. So um, what the treatment does is, is um, kind of postulate that the more, uh, the stronger the temperamental basis that you have, the more likely you are to have these kind of problems. And then on top of that, if you're in an environment which reinforces those principles, and it sounds as though what you're saying is like the Mormon environment would certainly reinforce those kind of like principles OC patients have. So it's a combination of temperament and environment. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and, and they definitely do. So when I look at... One thing I wanted to ask uh, Tom is, um, you know, when I'm explaining... Uh, you know, the bio temperament uh, and, and um, you know, kind of the social aspects. Well, a, a lot of people sort of have, you know, kind of an idea, you know, they have other personality models mm -hmm. that they use to, you know, kind of explain personality. And so that's one of the questions I get asked a lot is, does this, uh, does RODBT and how they view personality and temperament, is that the same as Myers-Briggs and introvert and extrovert? And they, you know, I'm just wondering, how do you respond to that? Do, do, do these two things translate? Is there overlap or are they, you know, kind of different things? How do you, how do you kind of find sort of the, the common uh, language uh, to, you know, explain this when, when somebody may be operating from a different sort of personality language or model, if, if that kind of makes sense, I guess. Yeah, um, I mean, Erica can jump in too on this, but um, I think that, you know, like there is overlap, of course, with other, you know, other theories, of course, but, you know, for example, just look at introversion and extroversion. We don't talk about that, those particular constructs so much and I'll give you just one example why, um, for example, an extroversion, it's now been shown that measures uh, that tap into extroversion uh, actually have two factors involved with it, which is both positive affect, high positive affectivity and um, agency. But it turns out, so that was, so you, but so you'd expect an over-controlled person not to be extroverted, but actually they have high agency. So you give them a measure of extroversion and they'll score low on the positive affect, the reward sensitivity. They don't really have lower reward sensitivity biologically, but they'll score high on agency. And agency means getting things done, being a doer, a fixer. So you could see that means then a person that's, you know, because of the way those measures have been developed, they just don't tap into what we now know about this superordinate personality style of over control. And so, you know, in that case, that's why we carefully use the words that we've developed and, and, try, and it's actually sort of, um, yeah, it's kind of, um, 
a little bit um, Yeah, and I newer, think that I there's that other way. factors as well, because very often um, when people first meet Tom and I, they might kind of think that um, I'm the extrovert and he's the introvert, depending on Tom's mood. Because Tom <laughs> leans towards under control, then he's very mood dependent. So if we go out somewhere and he doesn't feel like talking to people, he won't talk to people. But because of my rule-driven behavior, because I lean towards OC, then I feel socially obliged to try and do chit-chat and to try and make people feel okay. So I'm more likely to be the one that kind of tries to make conversation. I don't ever feel that I'm very good at it because I feel that I'm socially awkward because of my OC nature, but I'm more inclined to try it. So depending on the circumstance, people can actually think that I'm the extrovert <laughs> and Tom's the introvert. Um, and, and as we've said, we don't, we don't ever refer to those terms because of what Tom calls clumping. There's these two factors that just get clumped together. Mm. Um, and I think that maybe one of the reasons is that the, the research that Tom is citing although some of it is kind of like 15 years old, in the world of research, that's still new. There's still, you know, it's, it, that's not old stuff. So like the Myers-Briggs things, it came along before a lot of this research was developed. So they're kind of operating on older principles and Tom's kind of looking at newer research. Yeah, um, and that's what's remarkable about, about what happened and it has been happening. Um, in fact, the DSM-5 task force uh, for personality disorders was hoping to get under an over-control constructs into the DSM-5, but of course that there's always issues about getting anything in DSM-5 or any kind of DSM um, manual, I suppose. But yeah, um, I mean, it's when I think about things like what you just said, uh, you know, when it comes to under control, over control, another way to, I, I was thinking that, you know, if you ask an under control, why did you go to, you know, you're thinking about mood dependency. Why did you go to the party? Well, I, you know, I wanted to, I felt like I had time. That's why I went. Cause I was mood for it. I, you know, that'd be fun. So you ask an over control, why did you go to the party? Well, I thought it was the right thing to do, you know? So often they're doing things, not because the, it's motivated by emotion, but often, motivated by obligation, duty, or rules, rule govern behavior, but not always driven by a desire to say to approach uh, a reward because they may not see parties as very rewarding, but they would never tell anyone either. So necessarily they don't find them rewarding. Just mm -hmm. go there and you know, pretend like everything's okay. I'm fine. Yeah, this is wonderful. Isn't this good? Yes, we're having a good time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's super fascinating. I love thinking about it that way, that the kind of ways that we would assume you're extroverted or introverted don't always have to do with some of the motivations. I think you're talking more about mo what's motivating that behavior. And that's where your language is more appropriate. So you talk about psychological health or well-being involving three core features. Is that is that a place where it'd be helpful to go next? Okay. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we thought was, you know, I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, over control individuals are, you know, tend to be perfectionists. So, you know, and they're very serious people. They take life serious, um, you know, usually and, and that type of thing. And so we really recognize right away that if, you know, uh, if you're a perfectionist, you're always trying to improve yourself and you're looking for your deficits. How can you do better always? And, and so we started to think maybe that, you know, focusing total, solely on deficits may not be the, the best way to go. And we started to think then maybe we should start with thinking about where they sh might want to go in life as opposed to how to improve themselves all the time. And so we started to think maybe, maybe we should start with thinking a little bit about what is it that makes us as a species or anybody psychologically well or healthy. And so we thought that would be a good place to start. And that's really we define what we consider psychological well-being. And, and I guess I'll just do that right now, I guess, which is, you know, just think of someone you know that you think is doing psychologically well. And by the way, it's okay it's, if it's you, that's fine. Um, <laughs> but, but it, you know, at least for me, when I think about people that are doing, you know, psychologically okay, there's kind of three things I, I kind of have noticed with them. And one of them is that there's a sense of receptivity or openness, new experience or disconfirming feedback. And they do this in order to learn. That's how any of us learn. So they walk into a situation that's new or, or unexpected. And instead of immediately rejecting it or assuming they know the answer or know what to do, they allow themselves to grace to actually 
be open and receptive to new information. And, and, and that's the only way to learn, as, as I mentioned. So that would be one characteristic we've noticed. And then the second I've noticed, at least with people like this, is there's a sense of flexible control, I guess. In other words, they're it can flexibly adapt to changing circumstances. So, you know, I mean, I've been trying to get the prime minister in the UK, the United Kingdom, to change the driving law so that we can drive on the right side of the road. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> um, but the point there is that when I moved to Europe, I had to adapt to the different, uh, you know, driving conditions there. And I only injured a few people, I promise. <laughs> That's, you know, so the idea there, though, is not so much, so, you know, follow all the rules, say, for example, but have the capacity to, you know, break a rule if it's causing harm to someone, you know, that type of thing. And that's what we mean by flexible control, you know. Um, Can I just give an example there? Yeah, Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Sure. For example, you know, like most people have a rule that they wouldn't park in the disabled spot outside of the shops or something. <clears throat> But, you know, if you notice that there's somebody collapsed on the pavement and that's the only place where you can park to be able to get to them to help, then you would park in the disabled spot because flexibly that's the best thing to do in that moment. So it's to be able to be open to breaking rules. And that's one of the things we notice right away with over-control is, you know, when you have the bio temperament and you're in the clinical range with it, you're likely to not allow yourself to break a rule, even though it might be really adaptive or effective or helpful. Um, and that's and that can cause a lot of problems, as you might imagine. Now, the third thing that we think is important when it comes to psychological well-being is something I think sometimes I, I don't know. It seems to me like because of our advanced technologies that we've developed, the capacity to you know use fMRIs and look and do brain scans and look at what's going on inside the body and all this type of thing, I kind of think you know, on some level our scientific community has gotten focused on modeled mental health. And psychopathology that focus inside the body and kind of forget that actually our species survival depended on us being able to form close social bonds with people that weren't, you know, didn't share our genetic material, weren't in our nuclear family, weren't relatives, weren't kin, you might say. Mm -hmm. And that's how we were able to form. So we're tribal by nature. And so the, there's a person that's psychologically well, you know, more or less they're open to new information or criticism. That way they can learn. It doesn't mean they have to take it. I mean, it doesn't, so you might, but you have some capacity to hear it and reflect on it and not reject it immediately. You're flexible to changing circumstances. And then the third thing is to, you're, you have a capacity to form a close social bond. And the nice thing is this, you only need one person. That's what the data shows. You don't need a, a hundred Facebook friends hmm. to happy and um and it just turns out that when you have tribe when you have a person that actually has your well-being and you know they they care about your well-being and they're willing to make self-sacrifices for your benefit without always expecting something in return there is it's a very powerful social safety signal it's that people feel safe when they have those types of relationships so you know that's how we think about and that's then formed that kind of notion then helped become the basis for uh, what we do in the treatment, you might say. Okay. Well, and just to overlay again, kind of the Mormon community on these three things, you know, I think that we're, we're actually very good at number three, you know, the tribal aspect and supporting each other. And that's oftentimes what I see people really struggling with when they leave the Mormon community is mm -hmm. that lack of, you know, feeling connected to something that was, you know, just very, part of their lives. Number two, the flexible control is probably where we struggle the most, you know, and I always find it interesting. I always tease my, my Mormon clientele, because really, if you look at any scriptural story, that's worth any weight and interest anyway, <laughs> it's usually people, it's the story is interesting because they're breaking rules, right? So here's these people who are having to do something different to adapt to an environment or a situation where the rule as is doesn't work. And so I try to use that as, as a way to kind of maybe help people reframe some mm -hmm. of this breaking rules issue. And then I would say the receptive and openness is probably a mixed bag. I think that Mormons in general are open to a lot of new experiences, just even the missionary type of part of life, you know, where they go off into the world and experience new things is part of it. The, the feedback is a little bit 
disconfirming feedback is hard for us. And, you know, the openness is really only in structured environments. So, you know, I would say we have a bit of a mixed bag here, just cultural, you know, again, wide sweeping brushes, right? As far as the, the Mormon kind of community as a, as a whole. Yeah, no, oh, I think that's a good way of looking at it, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah, that's super interesting. So tell me about, I mean, I'm curious, you know, it's RODBT. So you still stayed with a DBT approach. What, what was helpful or what did you like about the DBT approach that you kind of reformed it in this way for these particular, for this particular personality of, of OC, over control, versus just creating a whole new model in and of itself? Okay, well, I think that probably important to say that apart from having dialectics in the therapy, there aren't any of the DBT skills included in RODBT. So it's not as if we've kind of um, adapted what was in DBT. And Tom decided to keep dialectics in because he thinks it's a really good way of kind of getting these people that are pretty rigid and rule governed to see that you can have two sides of an argument and there can be a synthesis between them so that there isn't always a right or a wrong way or a black and a white way of looking at things. So we kept the dialectics in because of that. He kept behaviorism in because it's a behavioral therapy. And there's kind of like a tradition in the therapy world to build on um, kind of what came before. So there was behavioral therapy, then there was cognitive behavioral therapy, and there's mindfulness-based um, cognitive behavioral therapy. So you can see how they kind of like build up. And um, we did have a lot of discussions early on about whether we should keep DBT in the name or not. But what we found is that in trying to disseminate the treatment, we were coming across problems in that um, the people that, the, the therapists that we were trying to reach, the ones that weren't necessarily working with borderline, but were working with depression or anorexia, didn't come along to our trainings because they had DBT in the title. They thought, like Kevin thought, it was just a tweak of DBT and they didn't think that it would suit their patients. And we had DBT therapists coming along who thought this is a tweak. And when they realized that actually it was for a very different client population, they were kind of thinking, well, am I seeing these patients? So it took us a long time to try to figure out whether we should keep DBT in the title or not. But we decided to because Tom felt that it was important to recognize the roots because he's like he started off with DBT, but more importantly that there's still dialectics and behaviorism in the therapy. And that's, that's kind of why we kept it RODBT. And then added the RO in the front, yeah. kind of like, well, it's what Tim Beck did when he, you know, with uh, behavioral therapy, put the C mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. And, and right. so it's, there's a tradition in, in at least the behavioral therapies to do that. And you can say Marsha did the same thing with DBT. Yeah, sure. Can you talk a little bit about the RO? I mean, it's radical openness, right? Is what it stands for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and can you talk a little bit about what what what's what's meant by those words in your? Well, it's the core. Yeah. And Erica, feel free to jump in on mm -hmm. this one too. But you know, radical openness is the core philosophical principle, and it's also the core skill in our ODBT. And, um, you know, essentially it's the idea of openness. I mean, you know, think about it. What, I, I actually do surveys sometimes. I say, does anybody like a know-it-all? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I haven't found too many people that like know-it-all. No. So know <laughs> um, it seems like really people understand and like open-minded people and when you think about it, but that's not exactly fully what radical openness is about because it goes further. That's why it's called radical. And so, you know, and, and one of the, and, you know, when you think about it, why do we like open-minded people? Um, because we instinctively kind of recognize that the value openness brings to relationships, for example, because, you know, we can trust them because we know that they'll be more likely to reveal rather than hide their inner feelings and things like this. And they're more likely to be humble and this type of thing. So, and humility is an important construct when it comes to social relationships because essentially it's a social signal that says, I'm no better than you. You and I are the same. We, and this is a core thing. You know, we all, we all have things that we can improve on and do better. And, and so uh, being a little humble or open to, to things that are different or criticism, um, you know, not only will you learn, but it also says that, you know, you're not um, better than other people is one way to think about it. 
Um, can, I, can I just jump in as yeah. well? I think um, one of the temperaments that we haven't talked about very much today is um, that OCs um, have attention, really good attention to detail temperamentally. So they, they automatically pick up um, minor discrepancies that are in the environment. So, you know, the people that notice that pictures aren't hung straight or that the books are misaligned in the, in the, in the, on the bookshelf or that there's a small grammatical error or that there's a, um, a, a comma missing in a sentence, they pick those things up naturally, whereas UCs tend to see a much broader picture. So they see the forest rather than the trees. And I think um, with the OCs that um, very often we notice these things and we're right in noticing them. We're correct in the sense that, yeah, there is a comma missing. And we try to force our will upon the world to say, you know, like, this is wrong. But a lot of the time, I think that as an OC, I need to be able to step back and ask myself, but how important is it? Is it really important that, you know, there's a comma missing? Or, for example, in my kitchen, you know, like I like to have all of my pans hang up from larger to smaller or my knives from bigger to smaller. And Tom doesn't follow the same thing. And so I have to ask myself, how open I am I to not having to have it quite so structured all of the time? And I, I think that's an important part of, of the openness as well. And maybe that's one of the reasons it's so important for us OCs. Personally, yeah. that's how I feel well, it I think, is. I think yeah. personally, it's helpful for everyone. I mean, the reason we have the radical in front of it is it goes further than just being open. You might say, I, I mentioned it it's kind of like developing a passion for going opposite to where you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it means actively seeking those areas in our lives that we may want to avoid or might find uncomfortable Yeah. in order to learn, you know, and it involves purposeful self-inquiry and a willingness to be wrong yeah. with an intention to change if it's changes needed. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, it's all those things. Um, and so rather than automatically assuming that the world should change, you know, like say someone invalidates you and say, you need to validate me because I feel upset, you know, or automatically prioritizing regulation or acceptance strategies every time something happens that you find distressing. Our ODBT says that the, the place that we grow, you know, the truth hurts. That's my grandmother used to tell me that, Tommy, the truth hurts. And I don't know about you, but for me, the times I've learned or grown the most have been times that have, it's not, it's often been a painful thing because I, maybe I didn't want to hear that information. I didn't want to change, mm -hmm. but, um, but when I did open myself up to it, um, that's when I grew. And so it's, it's kind of that type of approach, you know, I guess essentially it's just we're saying, you know, RODBT says that the most personal self-growth that we get involves coming to grips with or attending to the very place we don't want to go often, mm -hmm. the thing we don't want to hear. Or so how, because you did bring up acceptance therapy, how, how, can you speak a little bit about how it is a different approach from classic ACT? Oh, well, there was actually a really great article in the behavior therapist special section they did, um, which is the, the behavior therapist is a, a, the uh, journal that comes out from uh, the American, the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, it's a ABCT. And there's an article there that actually covers this very thing you're asking. And so that's a big question <laughs> and how it differs. Um, but essentially, um, I mean, where do we start? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, one way to think about uh, acceptance is, um, you know, when, like when Marsha talks about it, she talks about acceptance as trying, you know, essentially, let me see if I can find a quote from her on this um, right now. Uh, so I don't know much about ACT. I haven't been trained in ACT. Um, but what I do know is that when we do our, uh, our, our um, one of the, the main skills is a self-inquiry practice. We call it self-inquiry. So when we get disconfirming feedback or something uncomfortable happens, then what we do is move towards the discomfort. So we're not trying to accept the discomfort. We're actually moving towards it to be open to it and to try to find out what's causing the discomfort in order to see if there's something that we can learn there. So what we don't try and do is accept it or regulate it or um, kind of just, what's another word for accept? I don't know. I'm not well, so sure if I'm I mean, explaining it so well. Yeah, you know, Marcia, I'm actually looking at, how she might describe it you know she talks about radical acceptance is letting go of fighting reality and is the way of turning suffering 
that cannot be tolerated into pain that can be tolerated. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that radical openness challenges our perceptions of reality itself. Mm -hmm. So we argue that we don't know what we don't know, that um, every millisecond there's a, a lot of information coming through your sensory system that you're not even aware is impacting your experience of the world. And that we all have, as uh, was said by Kevin, uh, biotemperamental predispositions and, 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 and biases that influence how we see the world. So, um, you know, so it, it would kind of say radical openness posits that we're unable to see things as they are, but instead that we see things as we are. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that type of thing. So it's, it's really different than acceptance approaches, I guess, uh, you know, in that way. And then we have to, then we can drill down and show, I mean, I could spend, we could spend a couple hours talking about all the, uh, the minutia and how many there are, but the, at least that gets you started on that, that path. Um, yeah, that's really, I, I really appreciate your willingness to go into that. Cause I think these words matter. I, I think words matter, you know, as far as what we're, what we're talking about. And as, I think, especially to the public, a lot of these words can feel just kind of nice, acceptance, openness, you know, and so they can kind of blend into one another in ways that when we're looking at it from a clinical perspective, we're actually, you know, able to discern how some of those things are actually quite different. I would just be, I'm interested to know whether Kevin's got any thoughts on, because like you've been um, doing the self-inquiry stuff, I would imagine, since you've been on the training. So I'm interested in your thoughts on that, Kevin. Yeah, so I, you know, I could be wrong, but um, from my experience in working as a clinician, there's a lot of focus for clinicians and patients and clients. I want to get my mood under control. I want to get these emotions under control. I, I, don't, I don't want them to, to leak out all over the place. And, you know, I think maybe there's been a tendency with us to sort of in in working with a broad spectrum of individuals to sort of maybe pay attention to the ones that are more dramatic you know the ones that you know it's kind of, there's kind of a, a saying the squeaky wheel gets the grease mm -hmm. and maybe our strategies with medication and um, other types of therapy perhaps are really geared to uh, under control, you know, you see personality uh, coping styles, you know, and, and then at the same time too, we've got these very stoic individuals who are just exhausted and starting to experience what RODBT calls emotional leakage, you know, where I kind of say it's almost like there's this dam that's been holding back, you know, the river for so long. And then eventually the cracks start to form and, and emotions start to leak out. And, you know, some of these other therapies like CBT or ACT or, or, or standard DBT, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're really geared towards helping somebody to regulate their emotions, to kind of stabilize things a little bit, cool things down, maybe um, in some ways, you know, tighten things up a little bit. But that's not, that's not what an OC person needs. You know, they, they, they're starting to pull back from the tribe and they're starting to pull back from being open to new learning and new experiences. And so, you know, one of the core elements of RODBT skills, and Tom mentioned it, is self-inquiry. And this is really interesting to me as a, as, um, as a Mormon, because self-inquiry is, is a journaling practice that is really different than any other journaling practice I've really been exposed to. And Mormons will find it very interesting and very familiar, I think. Because one of the, and I'm going to just smuggle this, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but one of the aspects of self-inquiry is coming up with a good question and being open to uh, 
some new learning and new possibilities. And that involves sort of turning into the pain when you are feeling really distressed, that really when you're, when those emotions are starting to flare up and, and OC people probably don't always show it, but when we are starting to have those distressing internal experiences, that's a sign that we may be on the frontier in the cusp of new learning and new growth. And so those other strategies and maybe even medication to a certain extent, perhaps, are designed to dampen that down, right. you know, to, mm -hmm. to sort of turn in, in a different direction. And that might not be what an OC person really needs. So it's turning into the pain, uh, even, you know, just kind of temporarily, not, you know, forever, but turning into the pain and developing a good question. And for Mormons, you know, part of our scriptures and this idea of uh, new revelations uh, come from a good question. And so I think that'll be a very interesting thing as, as um, Erica and Tom prepare to invade Utah here, uh, <laughs> to spread, spread the, the, the gospel of RODBT. Um, Are you going to be presenting in Utah? Yes. Yes, we are. Yeah, we've got an intensive training at the end of, I think it's the 28th of October to the 1st of November. Cool. Yeah. And that's in Salt Lake City. In Salt Lake City, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Right. That's very good to know. Give us information for that and I'll make sure and link to that as well as yeah. any other things that you'd like us to link to for sure. Yeah. sure I, think, I think Mormon, Mormon clients and patients and, and Mormon practitioners and professionals will, will really, really find it um, very interesting and very compelling and um, and much needed. Uh, not not that everybody's Mormon in Utah, right? You know, but um, you know, a fair percentage are, right? Yeah, it's heavily influenced. And I love your thoughts that, you know, again, emotion dysregulation can sometimes feel like the problem. And, and I think what I'm hearing from a strength-based approach is that for OC people, the beginning of emotional dysregulation is actually a, a good sign. <laughs> like we want a little bit of that. <laughs> we want to lean into a little bit of not being so in control, right? Not having everything under wraps. And, and, and so if you just go through some of the traditional means of treatment and you dampen that, then you're actually missing out on huge opportunities of, of actual growth for this totally different personality approach that many people have. Yeah, that's, that's a nice way of putting it, Natasha. That's yeah. A, that's a really nice way of putting it, yeah. And there's a lot about the OC personality style, which is really useful. You know, it, it's important that we follow rules and it's important that um, we have social obligations and that kind of stuff. So what we don't ever try to do is to get rid of somebody's over-controlled personality style. What we do is we encourage them to love it because there's a lot about it that's really good. But we want, them to, we want people to look at those areas in their life where it's getting them into trouble and start to ask questions about why is it getting them into trouble there and what can we do to help them? So I just kind of wanted to make sure that we made that point that we don't, we're not out to change it. Yes, I love that. Cause you know, it's kind of classic, our, our, our biggest strengths can be our biggest weaknesses, right? And that's true of all of us. And so yeah. what about this part of me works? What about this part of me limits me? Right. Is, is a great, is a great framing. So I want to just throw out the question like, what haven't I asked that you were hoping I might ask or what direction did I not go that you were hoping you would be able to talk about, especially since you had heard my prior conversation with Kevin or at least parts of it. Is there anything that I didn't cover that you'd like to make sure you get in? In other words, we're open to feedback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I just think openness is, is one way to think about it. It's tribal glue. And, you know, recall that we're talking about, you know, we're saying basically that the problem for over-controlled individuals, it's not that they don't know how to regulate or control themselves, especially in public. In private, they can be very dysregulated, meaning in their family or at home, but out in public, that's when you're going to see the public persona that's very controlled. And in the therapy suite, that's kind of as private. So yeah, the therapy suite so is So therapists private. might see like outbursts, which might lead them to misdiagnose this person as borderline. But it's behavior that only happens within the therapy suite or at home, private. Yeah. And so since it's a disorder that we think is mostly characterized by loneliness, um, then, you know, one of the things that we recognize that 
when you're lonely, if you think about it, it's really hard to feel happy, no matter how much you try to accept or reappraise or, you know, change your circumstances or keep busy or exercise or practice yoga or distract yourself. You know, you, the list goes on and on. Loneliness is something that can't be cured alone. Hmm. And um, so, and it can't, it's not something that you can just meditate away, for example. It requires a relationship with another person. And unfortunately for our perfectionistic over-controlled individuals, they often learn to master their fuels. So they don't, you know, they don't, they hide what's going on inside or vulnerabilities and that type of thing. Why? Because they don't want to appear to be out of control. They don't want to appear to be weak or incompetent, and they don't want to be seen as making a mistake. So they often don't reveal weakness, but think about why you like your friends. Do you like them just because they got back from Hawaii and they, have a nice suntan and they just bought their third yacht. Yes, that's why you like them. You like that yacht. But <laughs> it's not the only reason you like them as a friend, I guess. I'm thinking that probably we like our friends because we know things about them that are difficult, that things that they're not proud of, things we understand where they struggle and they reveal that to us. And by doing that, they do two really powerful social signals. And this is what we think causes problems for over-controlled individuals because they're always trying to control themselves, they forget that when I reveal vulnerability or uh, to another person, another human, I'm saying two things. I'm saying essentially, I trust you because you know you don't reveal weakness to someone that's worthy. And but the, notice, I'm not by saying I trust you. I do it just simply by revealing vulnerability or, or being uh, revealing uh, you know weakness or a problem to someone. And the other thing I would be, you know, I'm signaling is that uh, you and I are the same. Mm. Uh, you know, we know, all humans know in their heart, or at least most do, I hope, I think they probably do, um, that, you know, fundamentally we're flawed, that we don't always do things correct or right, and sometimes we make mistakes. And so when you, anybody reveals a vulnerability or a mistake to another human, they're saying, yeah, I'm just like you, we're fallible. And so I'm no better than you again. And that uh, actually gets people to want to join with you. So when you, and the research shows this, people that openly express their emotions are trusted more and people want to spend more time with them. And the data, and a lot of this comes out of Stanford and our lab and other places around the world. This has been researched for quite some time that people that suppress or inhibit the expressions of their inner feelings, people don't want to spend time with them. And this is how loneliness starts to, emerge for our clients. And they've been suffering from this from, you know, age four or five, usually that's when it starts, you can start to see it emerge. You know, these are the shy, timid, risk averse kids, that type of thing. Mm. And uh, so it's, 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 uh, we're, we're glad that we got to where we are. It took a little while to get there, I guess you might say. And, and I'm glad that we took our time. We've done a lot of research to test it. And we're, we're now confident that what we put together we believe will make a difference. And the data seems to, well, the evidence basis is supportive of that as well. So that's kind of it, I think. I think we've covered a lot yeah, of stuff. Yeah, that's wonderful. Erica, any, any final thoughts from you as far as just interjecting anything that you feel like we've missed? Well, I, the only important thing that I wanted to get in, I've already said, which was about we don't try and get rid of OC. We get rid <laughs> right. of yeah. Right, right. Okay. Well, and Jeannie Randall- We don't want uh, all of our bridges to fall apart. Uh, that probably wouldn't be a good thing, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right, right. In other words, we need some of those control people to make sure. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 I, I would be very concerned if myself or Tom were uh, bridge inspectors because you know, <laughs> we'd probably be like, Oh, the bridge looks incredible. That's a tremendous <laughs> bridge. Yeah, it passes. That's great. It's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. And, that's I, and I would notice that, oh my goodness, there's a couple of things that aren't like stacked up properly there. This is going to wobble at some point. That's right. Right, right. That's exactly right. We had a hello from Oklahoma from Jeannie Randall. So thanks for joining us, Jeannie. Yeah, this has been a fabulous conversation as always. I, I'm just so grateful for your time. I, just the fact that I can, you know, talk to people who are, you know, are the founders of, 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 a, of a psychotherapy model that, you know, is, I'm sure going to have lots of impact on our communities. It's just wonderful. So thank you so much for spending your very valuable time with us today, Tom and Erica. 
Lynch, they're going to be in Utah presenting their model in the fall. So we're going to make sure and let you know about that. So that's going to be a wonderful opportunity for Utah clinicians. And I just want to remind you all that if you have find value in Mormon Mental Health Podcast, please consider a donation. There's also non-financial ways you can support us, like liking our page, making comments while we have interviews, uh, sharing the Mormon Mental Health Podcast, giving us a positive review, either on on iTunes or here on Facebook. So those are wonderful ways that you can help support this, this project. And if you want to make a donation, every little bit counts. I would say if everybody who listened just gave a dollar, we would make our, our, our fundraising goals no problem because we have a lot of listeners and you can do that at mormonmentalhealth.org. There's a very easy donation button to do that with. Tom and Erica, thank you so much again for your time. I hope that you recover from your jet lag. You said you had just gotten back from Seattle doing a training there. So thank you so much for joining us today. And Kevin, you as well. Okay, yeah, well, thank, thank you, Natasha. You. It was really All great. right. Okay. I, hope, I hope I get to meet you in person someday. So that would be great. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us today on Mormon Mental Health Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us and become a monthly subscriber at mormonmentalhealth.org. The goals of this podcast include education, advocacy, and the mental health and general well-being of Mormons and their families. We can't further this work without your support. Music for this episode was provided by the Lower Lights. Over last tempestuous sea Chart and compass Came from me Jesus saved No way before me roll hiding round and treasure show chart and compass came for me Jesus saved.
Then while we. Fear not.